Welcome to episode one of Exploring Mental Illness, Everything You Wanted to Know But Were Afraid to Ask. I'm Carrie Ballou, Community Relations Coordinator at Fuller Hospital in Attabar, Massachusetts. Uh, and with me is... Derek Mulhan, and I am a sufferer of mental illness, and I'm trying to be here to try to break some stigmas um, that go along with it. So Carrie, um, what, are we trying to, what are we trying to do with this podcast here? Derek, I really feel that this podcast is meant to make individuals aware of mental health and mental illness in our communities to break stigma to educate um, as somebody who has a background, a very diverse background in mental health. Um, I can say that education outreach and community outreach are so important to the care and the continuity of care for individuals who are suffering from mental illness. So I think we just really wanted to get the word out there. So um, for people who don't know us, why don't we do a little bit of a background on ourselves, not, you know, nothing too lengthy. So, um, what brought you into this field, Carrie? So I actually started off um, with a desire to be an art therapist because I had a passion for art and I had a passion for psychology. Um, when I went to college, I changed my major to art and psychology and just figured, you know what, I'll see where life takes me. And, and I had the absolute blessing of having my first job working for a uh, clubhouse model in Hopedale, Mass., and I worked with the chronically mentally ill population. But even beyond that, there is, there's a deeper passion that I have for the population besides the experiences that I've had working with these individuals. My father, my father is a diagnosed uh, individual with bipolar disorder, and I have seen him struggle throughout my entire life. And I've always had this soft spot in my heart for in, in, in a perspective of mental illness is not just your label. Mental illness is just an aspect of you. So from the outside world, someone may see, for instance, my father and say, that's so-and-so, that's Rick, he has bipolar disorder. But I always knew him as dad. That's my dad, and he just happens to have bipolar disorder. That, I strongly feel, influenced my passion for understanding, again, the human mind, focusing on psychology, and then leading into um, leading into working with individuals with chronic mental health disorders. I stayed in this field in Massachusetts for about five years, and then decided to make a life leap. I moved down to Pennsylvania, and I had the opportunity to work with a very different population. And I worked with individuals with intellectual disabilities and challenging behaviors, as well as chronic mental health disorders. It gave me a very different aspect of human services and healthcare. Um, I was a, a case manager for the majority of my time at this campus facility. Then I had the opportunity to make a leap and move more towards the admissions, outreach, community outreach, marketing piece of the field, which is quite a different step, right? To go from case management to marketing, how does that work? I offered a very unique and different aspect to the role. I had the opportunity to see truly both sides of, or, or all sides of healthcare. One of my sayings is often that facilities, organizations are in the business of providing care. You want to provide the best quality care for the individuals that you're serving, but it's also a business. And there is also needs that have to be addressed on, the, on that end as well. Uh, so fast forward, um, I stayed with this facility. It's called Wood Services down in Langhorne, Pennsylvania. I left there after about nine years to move back home, and now I'm here at Fuller Hospital. Which brings me to a follow-up question. With all that experience under your belt, what is your, uh, what is your role here at Arbor uh, Fuller Hospital? So my official title is Community Relations Coordinator. Um, I wear many hats. I work as a liaison with our referral sources, doctor's offices, hospitals in uh, Massachusetts and Rhode Island. I work on um, marketing, any sort of marketing needs. I also focus on um, planning um, events and community outreach events, such as the Behavioral Health and Wellness Fair. Um, and I also work with our Service Excellence Committee and team here to um, ensure that our standard of care that we're providing individuals is um, being met, as well as promoting an environment of excellence within our hospital. Excellent. 
So Derek, tell me a little more about your history with mental illness. Um, I have a long history with mental illness. Um, I remember having my first anxiety attack when I was six years old, and it's it's a memory that will be burned into my head for the rest of my life. I've had anxiety all my life. Um, it became really pronounced when my dad passed away. He was 48 and I was 20. He died unexpectedly of a heart attack. Um, so that's when my anxiety and um, my panic attacks really became profound. I always thought anything that was happening to me was I was going to have a heart attack and I was going to die. It was it was a very scary thing uh, to go through at the time. Doctors didn't really know what it was, so I was put on Paxil. Panic and anxiety disorders were very you know they didn't know a lot about them. And for the next you know few years, I really struggled. There was a point where I stayed in my house for nine months didn't leave the house. And I finally said, you know, I want to get my life back. And, you know, 23 years later, you know, better late than never. Um, I've gotten a grip on it. Uh, you still have good days and bad days. I was also diagnosed with clinical depression, which runs hand in hand with panic and anxiety. And um, you have good days, you have bad days, you have ebbs, you know, ups and downs. Uh, it's just, you know, retraining your mind how to think about these things. And um, like I said, you know, 23 years later, and it will always be a learning experience. It can't be cured, it can only be controlled, but you know, I, I live a great life. Sometimes it doesn't seem so great, but it is, you know, and there is benefits out there, but you really wanna have to help yourself. And so what has your experience been then as a consumer of mental health resources in Massachusetts and New England? Um, I go to uh, Butler Hospital in Rhode Island off uh, Blackstone Boulevard. Um, I've been there for over 20 years. They have uh, similar programs to the ones here at Fuller, outpatient, inpatient. I'm on currently on outpatient, but they have uh, day programs. They have weekly day programs where you go every day. And sometimes I go to the day program just for a refresher you know, to find out new things for, for meditation. I'm also lucky enough where um, I see a psychiatrist over there who takes care of my meds. And I also have a psychologist who I've been with for 24 years now. And so I get kind of get the best of both worlds. And Butler has been nothing, you know, they don't worry about the money. It's just getting you better. Same thing with, with my psychologist. They just want to get me better. The thing with therapy is it helps you, but you, ha you can only get the help as honest as you are with the person you're talking to. If you lie to them, you're not, you're not gonna get anything out of it. You know, my, you know, I see different therapists every two years at Butler because they rotate out, they go to bigger and better things. But my psychologist has stayed, he's been with me for, for a long time. And you know, um, sometimes people think that therapy is, you know, it's all happy stuff. And sometimes I leave therapy feeling worse, but it's not all fun and games. You know, your therapist wants to see you when you're bad, when you're good, and when you're indifferent. So my dealings with mental health care facilities in New England in general has been outstanding. I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for that and for the 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 positivity and the backup that they told, you know, you're going to be okay. You don't believe it. You say, I hope so, but then the mantra becomes, you're going to be okay. And you, I know so. I know that. I, I know that's going to happen. So it's been, uh, it, it's been great. I just think that nationally for the past few years, the, the ball has been dropped. It really has. So... And it's very, very discouraging to see. But as far as as far as New England, I, nothing but you know praise. So I look at you. I mean, I look at you essentially as a success. You are you are living and thriving. You have full time employment. You are managing your illness to the best of your ability. Would you say managing your your illness um, and as you mentioned, access to programs, obviously medication management, your day to day routine. It almost feels like a full time job. It is. It is. People don't realize that. Before I got to this point, like you said, it was 23 years, my daily struggles were I was afraid to die every single day of my life. I was a frequent flyer at Pawtucket Memorial Hospital. They'd give me an Ativan, they'd send me home. And it was one of those things. And after living in my house for nine months, my mother would have to come over and watch me eat, wait till I fell. I just was just sitting on the couch waiting to die. And now, later on, I don't my, my fears are a lot different. My fears are, am I ever gonna get married? Am I ever gonna have kids? Because the 23 years that I spent trying to overcome or trying to get a grip on my mental illness is 23 years where I should have been worrying about, am I gonna get a house? Am I gonna have kids? Am I gonna find someone 
you just you feel like you don't have anything to offer anybody that you're broken and that you're never going to be fixed and to a certain point it's true but you can be you can still be broken but have something to offer and there are still days to this point where i'll have you know some anxiety or some panic or it's mostly depression now where i'm just like i have nothing to offer anybody why should i you know I've been single for 10 years because I just felt I was broken. I don't have anything to offer anybody, and, and that's just not the case. But I think the bottom line is if you don't want to help yourself, then none of this is going to work because I've seen people, they just want to curl up in a ball, and they don't do anything about it. I wanted my life back. It's a tough thing living in fear every day of your life, and that's what I do. Some are unfounded fears. Some are very... They're very real fears, especially, you know, I'm going to be 47 in March, and I feel like I lost a lot of time battling this. But you know what? I wear it like a badge now. Mental illness used to define me. It doesn't define me anymore. I'm defined by what I do and the actions that I take, not the meds that I take that, that keep me in check. I used to be on seven meds, seven meds for my anxiety. I got down to two now. And I thought that was great. There's a you know mediation process, meditation, and it just um yeah it's 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 a fight every day, but it's a fight you're gonna want to do, and there are rewards to it, and there is light at the end of the tunnel. That's fantastic. So that's my experience um, and my continuing experience with um, mental illness, um, and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to be a part of this podcast. I'm not afraid to talk about my mental illness. Some people say that I'm too open about it, but I'd rather be more open than have skeletons in my closet. And the thing is that I hope this podcast, I can put my two cents in of someone who suffers from mental illness. You on the professional side, Carrie, um, will be able to put your two cents in with what's going on here at Abba Fuller. And I know you have a lot of guests lined up and we're gonna touch on a, a lot of things once again, like like the title says, that, that people want to know but are afraid to ask, which they shouldn't be afraid to ask, but with the stigma, and we're going to try to break down a lot of that stigma. I know that you've got some thoughts also on, on what we're going to be trying to do here also. Absolutely. Speaking of obviously trying to break down stigma, we will be talking more about ways that you can reach out to Derek and myself with any questions or feedback that you may have for us. Um, and we do, we have a really great lineup for the next several months just talking about giving you guys information and offering information and having open conversation from both like you said a service point of view and a community point of view um, on topics that will range from clinical depression to PTSD to suicide awareness gender issues and LGBTQ just to name a few and uh, we'll have local uh, guests that will be able to um, offer more insight into into these topics so we're going to take a short break and who do we have coming in we have a great first guest that you um lined up for us who's coming in absolutely so we have rachel legend uh rachel is the ceo of fuller hospital here in Attleboro, and she'll be joining us she has a, an extensive background in mental health and she'll be able to offer kind of a perspective of um services and mental health needs and issues in our local community Okay, great. Um, so stay tuned. Uh, this is Exploring Mental Illness, everything you wanted to know but were afraid to ask, and uh, we'll be right back. Okay, welcome back. We're going to have Carrie introduce our first guest, who she knows uh, very well here at Fuller Hospital. Thank you, Derek. I'd like to welcome Rachel Legend, CEO at Fuller Hospital, uh, to our first podcast. And uh, Rachel, to start off, how about um, a little bit about your background in the uh, mental health field? Um, thanks for having me. I appreciate being here. I'm a licensed social worker by trade. Um, I've spent the last 30 years of my career um, serving behavioral health clients in both uh, macro legislative work as well as micro doing clinical work with very high risk populations. So LGBT kids, um, and then sexual assault survivors, and then lastly, behavioral health patients in a psychiatric ED. So I started in the psych EDs um, and fell in love with behavioral health patients, um, primarily psychotic patients are who I really enjoy working with. Here at Fuller, I think one of the most rewarding things about everything I've done is looking at how do we take a patient when they first arrive, and then what do they look like when they leave, um, and we've created an environment where they can heal and access resources. I mean, that, that is the bottom line of what we do here every day. 
And um, what is the biggest misconceptions about mental health care facilities? Um, I think there's so many, but I guess the first I'd say is kind of the outdated view that we're an institution and it's an institutionalized feel. I think the great thing about Fuller Hospital is this actually used to be a family mansion back in the day and um, was a community family here. And so the old horse stables are actually a patient unit. Every single patient's rooms have windows. But I think the truth is, is that we are here to deliver compassionate care by licensed clinicians and psychiatrists who are here to do good work. And so we spend our days going to groups and um, talking to physicians and doing therapeutic interventions. I mean, that that's, I think, not a perception of people are sitting around medicated and not receiving services and not getting engaged, and that couldn't be further from the truth. Now, as one person uh, on my own, I've been trying to break the stigma of mental illness by becoming very open uh, talking about it very openly, not being embarrassed about it. I know why breaking the stigma of mental illness is so important. Why do you think it's so important, And but why is it so hard to do? Right. You know, I think the misconceptions exist about mental health, um, and it's rampant in our community because of the taboo of what people believe. I think it goes back to institutional comments I just made. Um, but the truth is the vast majority of us, us ourselves, have a family member or a friend who suffers from mental illness or substance abuse. And so the truth is when we realize that it touches many, many people in our lives and across all demographics, um, socioeconomic, genders, race, when we start to look at it and the impact that it has, then I think people like you are opening people's eyes, that, that it does. It impacts all of us. I mean, I have people who work for me and some of the most amazing employees I have who have mental illness and carry a diagnosis. And they're productive and engaged and compassionate. And I would say they even bring an added level of care um, to our patients because they understand um, what it's like to live in those shoes. I think the disease impacts a massive amount of the people in our community, and this facility works to treat those people in a compassionate, patient-centered way. Um, and we also serve as a beacon in our community for those who are in need or who seek help to say, we're here, walk in our front door, you know, let us assist, let us offer resources. Uh, Carrie, I think you had a couple of questions. I did. Rachel, how do you think gender plays a role in mental illness? I think that's an interesting concept because, um, and when we look at gender and society's impact on gender, um, we have all kinds of conceptions about how men and or women should behave. And so those social constructs of gender, we, we actually make up. And so what we believe about gender today is not how people perceive gender 50, 100, 150 years ago, or in different countries for that matter. The truth is it impacts both men and women. Um, but in some ways, the way it impacts can be different. We have different expectations on how men behave. We, we set those expectations um, and act like we know how men should be. Um, and when they act less than that, we call them weak or other more inappropriate names. So it makes it harder for men to seek treatment. And so we see um, for depression and anxiety, less men receiving treatment. For depression and anxiety, you see more women receiving treatment. And so it's our job at this facility, with the help of people like Derek, to say, this is an impact across the board because people experience trauma um, similarly. And so how do we set the stage for a man to be able to walk in and say, I need assistance with some of this stuff, but also to honor that the vast majority of women have trauma histories. And so how do we also create a facility and a team and a treatment team and physicians who are able to accept um, sexual assault survivors into this facility and treat them in a way that allows them to heal? I think it's also important when we're talking about gender to acknowledge the transgender gender community. And so this facility has worked really hard to make sure not only we abide by state statute and abide by hate crimes, but that we work diligently to create a facility that accepts all people, period. And so whatever that looks like, man, woman, transgender patient who comes in here and can be expected to be treated along with best practice, to not be re-traumatized um, by coming into a facility that doesn't know how to engage all patients with equality and respect and dignity. Can you give us an example or even a story of, of, of something that you've seen where you have been able to address this gender role, this gender issue within a mental health facility or setting? Um, I think I'd go back to um, the trans community, and I think it has been practice that um, trans clients or trans patients will be put in single rooms and will have separate and apart bathrooms. 
I think certainly history has told us um, that separate is not equal. And so we've worked diligently here to honor someone's known gender. And so if we have a trans man who comes in, um, we're putting him with a male roommate, access to the male hall, um, as well as access to male bathrooms. And so we frequently will get pushed back around that and say, what about the other clients? But the truth is we navigate this every single day in a vast majority of different circumstances. So people who are struggling with race issues and may, and may make racial comments, we appropriately place patients in rooms where they're going to have the most success. And sometimes we have to move those around. And that's the way it goes. But setting the stage for every single person who comes in here to be treated with dignity, to honor their identity, um, honor the work that they need to do and create a healing space for them, in fact, to do that. And we can't do that. Um, if we set the stage from hello, that we're not doing the right thing and not honoring who that human is. And so I think at Fuller, we've done an exceptional job all the way from intake to honoring people's preferred names. Um, and how does that look? And how do we set the stage on a unit for that to be carried through from beginning to end, from admission, from the very first time you walk into this facility to the day you leave and every single staff is on the same page about what my expectations are of my staff about how we treat patients, um, but also setting the stage across the board for other patients who are on the unit who may struggle, who may not have information, who may not have knowledge about that um, in a way that's appropriate and confidential, but again, honors that individual patient. I have a, I have a follow-up to that. Um, how tough has the learning curve been with the, the transgender problems that, 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 you know, that you face here at the hospital right now? Um, you know, I mean, I honestly, I think the learning curve is ongoing and I think it will be because, you know, I've done LGBT trainings for hospital systems, for schools, for HR departments for 20 years. And honestly, the trainings I did 20 years ago are super different than the trainings I do today because language changes, um, expectations change, statute and legislation changes, um, and the truth is, more often than not, it's the adolescent population of the gay, lesbian, bi, trans kids who kind of drive and push forward some progress. So the language isn't the same as 20 years ago. And so the learning curve is ever present, quite honestly. However, I will say that the best practices we've put in place here kind of set the stage for expectations. So we have a policy on how we engage and treat trans patients that addresses language, pronoun use, name use. Um, while we can't change a healthcare card or a medical record, that doesn't mean that we can't honor someone's name, restroom, room designation in a way that meets what their gender is. So it's ever changing and we're up for the task. And I think we do it better than most, quite honestly. I think that it's been practice, um, not best practice, but practice for a while for trans patients to be placed in single rooms and have access to single bathrooms. I think all the legislation around that, particularly that have come from students and parents um, litigating with schools shows that that's not an acceptable practice. And so a trans kid, or in fact now a trans patient, shouldn't have to go use, quote, the principal's bathroom or the nurse's bathroom or be taken off the unit or be put in a single room. Now, might there be an occasion when a trans patient it is appropriate? There's lots of reasons it's appropriate to put any patient in a single room for a vast majority of reasons. However, we should come from the place of we're honoring the gender of which they come in and, and identify as the name, the pronoun, and we move forward accordingly. And it's quite honestly that simple. I think the whole bathroom issue has been caught up on um, anatomical sex, which is very, very different from gender. And so when we honor that someone's gender is exactly what they tell us that is, it's super simple to move forward. When, when you break it down into what it's most simple of terms, we honor the gender of what a person identifies as. And then it's very simple, actually, to move forward. And will we have bumps? Of course we will. But we have bumps for all kinds of different reasons. And we navigate patients around those bumps. So yes, they board longer because people are waiting for single rooms. Um, they board longer because people will struggle with doing the right thing. And um, I'm not even saying those things necessarily are malicious. I think it's a matter of progressively catching up to where we are today. And with more and more people identifying as trans and being more comfortable, it's of note that we don't have more trans people than we've ever had. Actually, trans people have been revered in our country and across the world for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. They were known as our shamans, witch doctors, First Nation doctors. 
However, it, it, it's in the last hundred years that we've started persecuting and the level of violence in this community, particularly trans women of color, um, has gotten completely and utterly out of control. So it's very simple when you break it down to its most simple terms. Do the right thing by an identified gender and everything else falls into place. Sounds like that there is a definite need for education mm -hmm. um, within our state and I think our, our country and our communities. I know that for um, our health system, and Fuller participated in a, um, an education event back in June. And the nature of the event was providing culturally sensitive treatment for suicidality and substance use in the LGBTQ community. Um, what was your feedback and thoughts on that event? You know, my feedback and thoughts around any time I do any of these trainings always comes from a place of people aren't malintended or malicious. People are just in need of education and knowledge. And I think that, you know, we had 100 clinicians in that room and our surveys and the 30 individual conversations I had afterwards offline were, I just didn't know what to do. Um, and I wasn't sure what the right thing, but I want to do it. And so when we arm people with knowledge about one, what's our expectation as a facility? Two, what should be our expectation as clinicians? You know, as a social worker, we all take an oath to drive forward a patient's individual goals and needs. We don't have to agree with those to help a client drive forward positive goals. And so I think what came out of that was giving knowledge to people who desperately were in need. And you, you show up because you're saying, hey, I, I need some assistance with this. And so I think the feedback from that was amazing. I think um, people from this facility participated in that as well. And you move forward differently in the world after you have the knowledge about what are expectations and how do I do the right thing? Because I believe most people want to. So stepping back, I think our final question uh, would be, where do you see mental health treatment and access to resources going in the next five years? Um, well, you have to look at that question through a political lens. Um, politics will always drive health care as we're looking at what will happen with Obamacare. Will we get a new um, health care system in place? So that's all going to drive it. You know, Massachusetts was just listed number one place to raise families. And one of those reasons was because of health care, because we require that here. So as we look forward and figure out what we're going to do in the next five years, I think it will be very interesting to see what happens with our national health care and how that goes. However, we do know currently we're in the middle of an opioid epidemic. And so... My facilities director was just sharing that he has a house in um, New Hampshire and in Manchester and one funeral home. They bury two to three people a week from an opioid overdose. So it's one community, one funeral home, and one city. So if they've got two to three, you can bet the other two to three funeral homes have the same. We have to look at how does the psychiatric facilities such as mine, but really the behavioral health community as a whole come together and say, what are we going to do? And so... It requires um, additional beds, but it also requires a different kind of bed, right? Um, substance abuse, while we can treat detox in short-term in an inpatient setting, working on your substance abuse issues is a long-term lifetime illness and disease that you're always fighting. And so Fuller's just one piece of that puzzle. Um, and we have a great program that we can step people down to. Then we have an intensive outpatient that we step people down to. Um, and then Fuller Counseling Service will carry someone outpatient. So we call that a continuum of care, right? It, it requires long, long, long-term care. And how do we set that up? So I have two, two dual diagnoses, so a behavioral health disorder and a substance abuse disorder. I have two units of which we can treat those folks on. But I do think we have to come together as a community. And as a community means community members, community leaders, behavioral health facilities, behavioral health providers, insurance companies, payers, mass Medicaid, government agencies, and figure out how collectively do we put an infrastructure in place. Because full is just w one piece, just one, one small piece. We all have one small piece. And so when you talk about parts of the whole, you have to get everybody in the same room. And I know these conversations are happening. And I think we have to continue to look at it because the truth is, you know, we have a great team here, right? And any given day, a patient has a psychiatrist, a mental health worker, a nurse, an activities therapist, a social worker, all working collaboratively with their engagement, a patient engagement to say, what are my goals? What am I looking to do while I'm here? But the Fuller piece has step downs, but these folks require wraparound services. And we all have to collectively come together to figure out how do we put those in place? How do we put those in place at Fuller? How do payers pay for those? How do politicians mandate those? 
Um, and how do clinicians be able in the community to say what do they need and be able to provide those services? So touching a little bit more about the community outreach aspect and getting everybody together in one room, uh, Fuller recently began a collaboration with the Attleboro Police Department um, to create a drop-in center model that has actually been mimicked um, a few times now in the state of Massachusetts and started out of Bridgewater, um, where individuals can access services in the community. What are your thoughts on this type of model as a more forward-thinking way of accessing services? I think, going back to Derek's earlier question, that um, psychiatric hospitals can be perceived as scary places, and our, our units are locked. And so can you imagine the crisis someone feels when they walk into a unit and the door locks behind them? And so that's scary. So I can imagine starting in a place that's a drop-in center, like a church or any other community center, where you're having a conversation with a clinician to say, I'm struggling, what do I need and what can you do to help me, um, is a far easier way to enter the system than an emergency department, right? And I, I love psychiatric emergency departments. They're my absolute favorite place to work and be. However, I acknowledge that rises folks' anxiety around that's the way they enter the system. And so I think the drop-in center is a great place for for our community to be able to go. Um, I don't have enough good things to say about Chief Hegney and what Attleboro Police Department and the collaboration, not just with the drop-in center, but with Fuller has been. Um, I think the chief is amazing. And I think our work together over the last two years that I've been here has been spectacular. And I appreciate him and his officers. Um, and I'm also excited about um, Mayor Haro coming in. And he's already been in this facility. He has an absolute commitment to behavioral health. And um, I think the community and our community leadership is moving in the right direction. I think the um, communication is also key, with especially with the drop-in center. Um, I mean, a lot of folks have, you know, white coat syndrome when they just go to the regular doctor. You know, when, when I was being from Rhode Island, you know, as a outpatient at Butler Hospital, when I first went in, they explained everything to me. And then they explained it to my mom in case you know, they didn't get through to me. And I just saw all these doctors, listen, you're going to go in. Yes, the door's going to lock behind you, but this is for your own safety. And the lines of communication at the, at the drop-in centers at, with, with the POP team is outstanding, you know, and, and it gives you less reason to be afraid and more optimistic to say, you know what, there's no need. I mean, you're going to be afraid depending on what you're, what you're suffering from, but it shows you that there's going to be hope and that people are going to take care of you. And we didn't have a POP team back then. It was just my medical doctor prescribed me with what I had and then, boom, off to Butler right. in an ambulance. That was scary. Absolutely. My mom was there and she was explaining everything. It was a lot easier coming from my mom. But then as as I became more of a, you know, well, I'm a regular over there. I mean, it's been 23 years. You get comfortable with the people and they know your name. And I think the biggest thing that the uh, the, the POP team does in the drop-in centers is the, the open communication. And like I said, in, in a church. And it's, it's a great setting where people don't have to be afraid. Absolutely. I totally agree. Naming and claiming mental illness um, definitely reduces the stigma, especially when it's the people we care about coming out, if you will, right? Right, coming out we usually use as an LGBT term, but I like to explain coming out to people as telling someone something that you're not sure how they'll react. Because the truth is every single person knows how that feels, right? It doesn't matter. Is it about mental illness? Is it about being a domestic violence survivor? Is it about being a child of an alcoholic? Is it about being a lesbian? Like whatever it's about, we all know what that feels like. And so the truth is that that is what it feels like. And so how do we honor that and support people? And on they're already in crisis, right? N no one is coming to Fuller's front door um, because they're having a good day. And so we need to be prepared, literally from my front desk staff, through the nurse who says hello, while they walk on the unit, to the first mental health worker they engage with, all of those people to be hand-holding and compassionate and engaged and full of information and creating a place that feels safe. Because that, that's the first step. If you don't feel safe, you're not going to, you have no ability to work on anything and you're not healing. Um, first and foremost, do you feel safe? Can we reduce the anxiety to a place that you can start thinking about what are what are the things that I actively need to work on to feel better. It's funny you said talking about coming out because I was I had, um, I had told Carrie it'll be five years in February that I came out on Facebook mm -hmm. about my struggles with mental illness for the past twenty years at that time, and I got you know like 
two or 300 likes. I had all these private messages and I said, I appreciate, you know, what you folks, but I didn't do it for likes. I didn't do it for, I just want to let you people know my car can only break down. So times I kept lying, you know, I lost jobs. I lost friends. I lost, it was like a huge weight was lifted off my shoulders. But then I got a lot of private messages, about 50 to 60 private messages. Hey, you know what? I suffer from the same thing. Right. So unfortunately, but fortunately, I was kind of an expert at the time on what they were going through. So now they would call me at midnight or one or two or three in the morning, say, hey, I'm having an anxiety attack. Okay, calm down. It's going to be okay. Um, and coming out on Facebook, you know, that was that was my big thing. And like I said, there was a huge weight lifted off my shoulder and there was no blow. Everybody's just like proud of you, you know, and I knew some people knew, but I don't think they knew to what degree and how bad it was. And doing that, you know, people, you know, they check in on, hey, how you doing? Haven't seen you on Facebook in a while. Haven't heard from you in a while. Well, I'm having a tough time. So like I said, you know, I just wanted my life back. That was the biggest thing. So I don't, I don't understand why, you know, I, I, you know, from when you said before you get called names and stuff like that, but if you've got friends and you've got a great support system, they're not going to hold it against you. Granted, I lost some friends, but most of my friends, when I came out and I told them what I was suffering from, they did research on it so they could try to help me. Right. Have a more engaged conversation. Right. They would go on the internet and they just wouldn't say, oh, it's an excuse. It's, it's an excuse. He's using his, his anxiety, depression, and his panic as an excuse. Well, no, I'm not. And if you've seen the hard work I've done over the past 25 years, you'll know I don't use it as an excuse. I use breaking down my car as an excuse to cover up my mental illness. I don't cover it up anymore. I wear it like a badge. I own it. But it doesn't define who, you know, who I am anymore. I agree. You know, that was part of the reason. So I, I live in this community, right? I used to live six minutes down the road, and I would drive by this hospital consistently. And I actually only knew of this hospital because I also ran a behavioral health um, facilities in Rhode Island. And so when I first got hired here, I thought, you know, that, that that's my local grocery store next door. Um, th this is the main thoroughfare. More people need to understand what the White House on the Hill is, because when we start to understand that Fuller is integrated in this community, people who live and work here um, live in this community. And so when Carrie came on, the first thing I ever said to her is, I want a community fair on our front lawn. And lo and behold, less than a half a year later, you know, she produced 400 people in 50 um, community resource vendors. And so, and that's where I met you. And so that that's important, right? That's how we do this is, Come on my front lawn, meet my staff, say hello, carnival games for the kids. Let me show you who we are and what we're about and what we do here so that we can, again, we're always working to kind of reduce the stigma that you continue to talk about. Because the truth is people work at Fuller because we are looking to help people make their lives better. And people are here because they're struggling. There's not anyone in this facility who isn't currently sick. And so how do we get them better? And... Part of it is, is the community fair, is things like the semicolon project so that we start to have some visibility around mental health. And so we'll have another community fair this summer. We'll continue to invite people into our front doors to tour our facility, to come on our front lawn, to hang out with us. Um, because the truth is, that's the only way to start to break it down. You know, I had to put us, I put a banner out front that says walk in welcome because I want people to know that you can walk into our front door. You don't have to make a call. You don't have to get a PCP referral. You don't have to go to an emergency department. And that doesn't mean you're going to get hospitalized either. It means I'm struggling. Can you help? And our answer is always going to be yes. What is it you need and how do we make it happen? And, you know, my, my staff kind of makes fun of me consistently, but one of my sayings is we come from a place of yes here. And so can we make it happen? The answer is yes. Can I help that patient? The answer is yes. Can I get you to where you need to go next? Yes. Can I make you feel better? Yes. And we can't do it alone. We can't do it without the patient's engagement. We can't do it without with a whole team. Um, but the answer is yes. We come from a place of yes. How can I help? Yes, come in my front door. Yes, come and ask for help. Yes, we will be there to answer. What would you like people to know about Fuller? Aside, it, you know, you don't want people just to think, oh, that's the house up on the hill where the crazy people go. Right. So your, your final thoughts, what, what do you want people to get out of today's uh, message? I'd like them to see Fuller as a resource. There are engaged staff. There are, you know, 
my CFO started here as a housekeeper and never left. And he still has his housekeeping shirt on the back of his door. You know, my director of facilities, Fuller owned the entire neighborhood up behind here. And uh, his mom was a nurse here. And he grew up with Fuller renting his mom one of those houses. And he's never left here. Um, that's what Fuller is. Fuller is a place that has engaged staff who are here saying, we want to help. We're here to help. But this community should know is we should be a resource. You know, you, you do not have to go to an ED. You do not have to go to a clinic. You do not have to go to your PCP. And it doesn't mean you're going to get hospitalized either. We, I have a partial hospitalization program where you can go for the day. I have an intensive outpatient program where you can go three times a day or do half days. There are many, many options to get you help um, that don't necessarily end up in inpatient level of care. However, we have that if that's where you are as well. And so if people could start to see fuller one is a place that's accessible, because that's very important to me, um, but two, as a resource. Um, and even if it's just to go straight to outpatient, how do we help you set up that therapist appointment that has just been too hard for you to do on the outside? Because patients, if they could have done it, they would have already done it, right? No one's more committed to a, a patient's care than the patient themselves. And so frequently I find if they could have made something happen, they already would have. And so how does Fuller offer that next step to actually get them that piece? Whatever whatever it is. We should be accessible um, and we should come from a place of yes. Rachel, I just honestly want to say thank you for your uh, participation today. Hearing you helps to confirm the reason why I know personally I'm here and I work um, for this hospital. You are a fantastic leader and example in the mental health community and I have seen that firsthand. Um, I think that the feedback that you provided today has been very insightful and um, heartwarming when it comes to moving forward with mental health in our community and awareness and breaking stigmas. So thank you again for joining us today. We really appreciate thank it. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you all. Appreciate you guys. So we want to thank uh, Rachel Legend. That was some um, very informative information that we had here uh, today. Great first guest, uh, great way to start off. As someone, who, once again, who suffers from mental illness, I just want to let people know out there that you're not alone, that there is help. You just need to seek it. And if you think there's something not right going on, better to be safe than sorry. Don't wait until you're at the point where there's no coming back from it. There's a lot of help out there, and, and Carrie's got a lot of good information right here, right now, about what you can do and where you can seek help. Carrie? Great. Thank you, Derek. Uh, <clears throat> so for those that may live in the Attleboro, greater Attleboro community, um, you may be aware or may not be aware that there is a drop-in center called the You Are Not Alone Drop-in Center. And this was a collaborative between Fuller Hospital, the Attleboro Police Department, and area organizations to offer services and resources to people in the greater Attleboro community regarding mental health and substance abuse disorder. The You Are Not Alone Drop-In Center uh, is held the last Wednesday of every month at the Murray Unitarian Universalist Church at 505 North Main Street here in Attleboro from 5.30 to 8 p.m. Uh, we focus essentially on just trying to get people the help that they need. We offer um, representatives and information from a tremendous amount of resources in the area, from an inpatient level of care such as Fuller to outpatient resources such as South Bay to community groups such as Learn to Cope. Um, if you'd like to learn more about the Drop-In Center, you can find us on Facebook um, at Attleboro Recovery. Um, you can also contact us directly at 508-222-1212, extension 1951, to learn more about this drop-in center. And we, we absolutely welcome anybody in the community. Uh, we do focus on anonymity. You're more than welcome to come, whether you're a family member or an individual who needs help, to access resources um, or to even seek voluntary treatment that night. Now, in addition to the drop-in center, I, I'm very honored to be a uh, part of Fuller Hospital and um, the resources that we're able to offer. If you have questions about um, our, our resources, our services, um, please feel free to um, either contact me directly. Um, again, Carrie Ballou, Community Relations Coordinator here at Fuller Hospital. Um, you can contact the main number, 508-761-8500. And we also accept walk-ins. I think that's something that surprises a lot of people. And you'll see our giant banner on the front 
front, as, as Rachel had mentioned. Um, please feel free to come to our hospital. We are, we are available and open 24 hours a day. For additional information regarding um, Fuller's services, you can also go to arborhealth.com and select Arbor Fuller Hospital in Attleboro, Massachusetts. So if you're, you are in crisis and you needed some additional help in the community or outreach, there is the uh, CCBC Emergency Service Provider. They are located at 508-285-9400. Uh, their address is 108 West Main Street, Suite Number 5 in Norton, Mass, 02766. They are available 24 hours a day um, and are able to assist with assessment of your uh, mental health needs. And then lastly, I would like to put out there the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. Um, it is a 24-7 free and confidential support for people who are in distress, who um, are seeking prevention and resources. Uh, their number is 1-800-273-8255. And I think finally, if this is an emergency and you find yourself in um, a medical or a crisis situation, you can also contact 911, and there is also the local emergency room providers as well. Also, if you would like to ask us questions, we do have an email, um, mental illness at wararadio.com. Once again, that's mental illness at wararadio.com for any questions that we can answer for you. Um, this podcast will also be able to be heard um, at wararadio.com. That's our website. We hope that you, you've gotten something out of this um, so far. This is going to hopefully be one of many podcasts uh, that we'll be having. So for uh, Carrie Ballou, I'm Derek Molhan. This has been Exploring Mental Illness. Everything you wanted to know but were afraid to ask. Until next time, be well. The contents of the Exploring Mental Illness podcast provides general information and discussion about medicine, health, and related subjects. The content provided in this podcast, its associated website, and any links material are not intended and should not be construed as medical advice. This podcast should not be used in any legal capacity. No guarantee is given regarding the accuracy of any statements or opinions made on this podcast or its associated website. If the listener or any other person has a medical concern, they should consult an appropriately licensed healthcare professional. The views expressed on this podcast do not represent the views or opinions of Attleboro Access Cable Systems, Arbor Fuller Hospital, or their parents' corporations. The contents of the Exploring Mental Illness podcast and its associated website are copyrighted Attleboro Access Cable Systems. The podcast may be redistributed in accordance with Creative Commons License 4.0.